<clears throat> well, last week, uh, we saw how instead of defending their countrymen, or even defending their own freedom, the tribe of Judah wrongly handed Samson over to the Philistine army. <laughs> To make matters worse, the reason why they did this was to preserve what can only be called a false sense of peace. Uh, Israel was already enslaved by the Philistines, and so by betraying Samson, they merely hoped that the Philistines would at least not treat them worse. It's clear that by this point, the nation of Israel is a thoroughly defeated people. Their sin has taken them far from being the great nation they should have been. Even Samson himself is very much a product of Israel's sin as he has great weaknesses both for women and for vengeance. Weaknesses that have landed him in very hot water. Yet in spite of all that has gone wrong, nothing can thwart the plans of our sovereign, almighty God. In his grace, he is beginning to save Israel from the Philistines as the Holy Spirit empowers Samson to defeat large numbers of Philistine soldiers. And so God is moving, but human sin is still an issue. And the same thing can be said even now in our day and age. Sin is still very much an issue. We know that. We see that. It's even in us. It's in me. But God is still moving, even today. Amen? Amen. 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 The question is, how can you and I join him? Please turn with me in your Bibles to Judges. Uh, we're going to look at chapter 15, verse 20, through chapter 16, verse 3 today. Judges chapter 15 verse 20 through chapter 16, verse 3. Just a few short verses. Uh, I'll begin by just reading uh, verse 20. Uh, Judges chapter 15, verse 20. This is God's holy, authoritative, inspired, and inerrant word. Judges chapter 15, verse 20. And we'll look at 16 verses 1 through 3 in just a little bit. But 15, verse 20 to start. And he, that Samson, judged Israel 20 years in the days of the Philistines. Now at first glance, as we look at this verse, we see that it looks a lot like other verses that we have seen earlier in the book of Judges, summarizing the rulers, or the rule of these governors. But there are some key differences. The first key difference is the location of this summary of rule. Most other judges have had the years of their rule recorded either right at the end or near the end of their historical account of their lives. But this is not the case with Samson. The history of Samson continues for a whole other chapter. Why is this? Well, for most of the judges, their career was defined by one event, uh, neither near the beginning of their rule or very close to it. Othniel, for example, he defeated the king of Mesopotamia. Ehud defeated the king of Moab. Deborah, with the help of Barak and Jael, defeated the Canaanites. And Gideon, too, defeated the Midianites, and so on and so on. And most of the time, after God helped a judge lead Israel to victory over their oppressors, the hard and most noteworthy part of their career was over. Uh, however, this is not the case with Samson. His defeat of 30 Philistine soldiers as payback for cheating, his burning of the Philistines' harvest for giving his wife to another man, his great slaughter of even more Philistines for murdering his wife. And now his defeat of a thousand Philistine soldiers after they tried to kill him are all noteworthy feats in and of themselves. And together those four events 
over the course of only about a half a year, mark the beginning of, of Samson's career as a judge. Yet, despite all four of these feats being very noteworthy, they are only as effective as Jephthah's defeat of the people of Ammon. Like the Philistines, they continued to be a problem for Israel even after they were defeated. And this is clear in the second notable difference here in Judges 15, verse 20. With God's help, most of the previous judges in this book were able to give Israel peace for a certain number of years after defeating their oppressors with Othniel, 40 years of peace. Ehud, 80 years of peace. With Deborah, 40 years of peace again. With Gideon, another 40. But after that, we have seen things start to fall apart. Several more judges come to power, but despite their rule, there's no peace. No peace. Only after Samuel unites the nation in repentance towards God in 1 Samuel chapter 7 does the nation of Israel finally end the 40 years of being enslaved by the Philistines. And so we come to this question. How can you, how can I join God as he is now still working to save sinners. How, how can we achieve some level of peace? Well, first, as we see with Samuel, repent of your own sin and then join in with others who have done the same. You know, it's been said, and I think rightly so, that the church is a hospital for sinners. But it's a hospital, we must remember, that discharges its patients to bring the healing of the gospel to the rest of the world, to bring peace with God to the rest of the world. And this is why I once again encourage all of you, uh, I have in my notes, to join me tonight, but because I'm not feeling well, I'm not going to be able to go tonight, but I still encourage you all to go tonight, and I would go if I could, I don't think I should, uh, go to First Baptist Church tonight uh, from 4.30 to 6 for the Ignite Evangelism Conference. Um, I, I firmly believe that this conference would help all of us to better share our faith with Jesus with others and help achieve peace with God. Uh, after all, Christ has sent out his church to evangelize. But the church is also a place for accountability. Even after you and I become Christians, we must admit, and we all know, that we're still tempted to sin. That does not go away after we trust in Christ. And so it really does help to have other brothers and sisters in the faith who are encouraging us, who are exhorting us uh, from falling into a pattern of sin. But by working alone, Samson doesn't have that. If you neglect the church and think, I can get by on my own, I don't need the church, it's not going to work out so well. Um, in fact, Samson, trying to be a lone ranger, gets him in trouble. Turn with me now to Judges 16, 1 through 3. Judges 16, 1 through 3, let us read that now together. What does it say? It says, now Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot or a prostitute there and went into her. When the Gazites were told, Samson has come here, they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. They were quiet all night saying, in the morning, when it is daylight, we will kill him. And Samson lay low till midnight. Then he arose at midnight, took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two gate posts, pulled them up, bar and all, put them on his shoulders, and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. So we've looked at a summary of 
Samson's rule in chapter 15, verse 20. 16, verse 1 now takes us to an unknown point further into Samson's 20-year rule. The setting is a city called Gaza. It's a city that still exists today. It is controlled by the Palestinians. And while the Philistines controlled several cities and towns over the years, Joshua 13.3 and 1 Samuel 6.17 tells us that they had five principal cities, each with their own Philistine lord or king. Gaza was one of those five major cities, the other four being Ashdod, Ashkelon, Ekron, and Gath. Uh, the, the Philistine giant, Goliath, will later be born in Gath. And uh, earlier in Judges 14, 19, we see that Ashkelon was where Samson defeated 30 Philistines single-handedly. But of these five major Philistine cities, Gaza... Here in Judges 16.1 was the furthest away from where Samson grew up, about 45 miles from the camp of Dan. Gaza was also the furthest city away from friendly Israelite territory out of all the Philistines' major cities. That's also probably why the Philistines take Samson there after they capture him later on. So in this case... Think of it this way. Samson has voluntarily wandered very deep into enemy territory. And yet he seems the least bit concerned. Friends, I hope you and I, if any of us start to wander very far from God or very far from his people, that the Holy Spirit will start sending alarm bells up in our heads. We, we need it. I need it. Because it's when we're alone that we're most vulnerable to temptation. And that temptation often does its worst damage. You and I need help from other believers in order to resist temptation. We, we need it. We might not like to admit it, but we need it. And part of the reason why we know this is because while Samson is alone, deep in enemy territory, what happens to him? He becomes tempted, and he commits sexual immorality with a prostitute. With this sin, the enemy sees an opportunity. After all, as the Bible will tell us later in the New Testament, the devil is always seeking to devour us. In Judges 16.2, the Philistines of Gaza hear it reported that Samson is somewhere in their city. But apparently they don't know exactly where. But this is not a big deal for them. Because wherever Samson is, they know if he's in the city... We got him. He's surrounded. Because the city of Gaza, back at that time, had a wall that went all the way around it. Uh, and the only way, therefore, in or out of the city was through a gate. Now, whether Gaza had one gate or several, that we don't know. But whatever the case, we do know from other walled cities at the time that every gate that they would have had, however many they had, would have been made with two gate posts, uh, each holding a large swinging wooden door that was about two stories tall. Uh, if you're into the Lord of the Rings uh, and you've ever watched Return of the King, uh, think of the gates of Minas Tirith, those large wooden gates going into that major city in the last movie. Uh, it would look kind of like that, okay? Uh, but these two very large, heavy doors were then held shut by a strong metal bar. Along each gate, there also would have been somewhere between four to six uh, rooms, each filled with guards, in order to further prevent people from... Uh, 
going in and out of the city without Philistine permission, I guess you could say. And so the Philistines' plan, knowing that, God's, that, that Samson is somewhere there in Gaza, is to just stay quiet for now in these guard rooms by the gate. They're going to do so throughout the night. But then in the morning, when the sun is up and sunny boy Samson reveals himself, they're going to kill him. That's the plan. But Judges 16, 3 says, after laying down for half the night, Samson gets up in the middle of the night and goes to the gate. Now, for a reason that the text doesn't state, the Philistine soldiers guarding the gate don't engage him. They're there. The text says that they're there. But the text also indicates they don't do anything when Samson comes. They can see him. They don't do anything when he comes. Why? Are they asleep? Not likely. Because even if they were, they would have been woken up by what Samson does next. And so, if they're awake, why don't they engage? Uh, well, you could point to the fact, well, the plan wasn't to engage until morning. But if, obviously, if Samson shows up early, obviously you need to fast forward your plan, Right? Yet the Philistine guards do not. Why? Well, some might be hoping well, maybe the gate will hold Samson until reinforcements arrive, you know? Kind of like what we saw in South Texas. But in all likelihood, when push came to shove, the Philistine guards were probably just too scared to attack Samson when he appeared. After all, they know what he's capable of. They know what he's capable of. He killed a thousand soldiers in a single battle by himself. You go. You know, I mean, what, what do you think? How do you think you're going to do? Uh, and so the guards don't engage. Meanwhile, Samson does engage the gate. And he pulls out the whole thing. Door, doors, posts bar, and he pulls it all out in one piece. And Samson then puts this two-story gate on his shoulders, and he carries it all the, all the way up to the hill that is in Hebron. Now, if you don't know where that hill by Hebron is, what verse 3 says doesn't mean as much. Sure, yeah, that two-story gate had to have been heavy. Had to have been. But let me explain where Samson carries it, okay? He carries it 38 miles east. Furthermore, Gaza to this day, don't, I wouldn't recommend visiting, it's not a great place. Uh, but Gaza to this day, where is it? It is right next to the Mediterranean Sea. It's only about 50 feet above sea level. It's, it's, it's right there by the ocean. Hebron, on the other hand, is where? It's up in the mountains of Israel. And so Samson not only carries this whole two-story gate 38 miles to the east, he does so while going over a half mile uphill. If you thought a 26-mile marathon was hard... Consider this. I don't see anybody doing this like they try to replicate the runner at Marathon. And Samson does this, or starts to do it, right in front of a whole city of Philistines. And what do they do as they start to see him do this? Absolutely nothing. They do nothing. I can almost hear the guards whispering to each other, can't you? Uh, hey, you know, if you want to attack that guy, go ahead. I'm going to stay back and see how that goes. You know, you know, you know so. Uh, they're too scared! But as impressive as Samson's latest feat of strength is, what does it accomplish? What does it accomplish? We already knew before that by the power of the Holy Spirit, 
Samson is the strongest man who ever lived. We already knew that. How does carrying, carrying a gate up a mountain further prove that? And furthermore, more importantly actually, how does that help Israel? How does that help Israel? And we can ask similar questions today. Let's say you're really skilled putting a round ball in a round hole. That's great. How does it help God's people? Because it all comes back to people. The consistent testimony of retired athletes when it comes to what they miss most about their sport is the people. It's all about relationships. And as Christians, we know that the sweetest and most helpful relationships are those with whom God and his people, right? So how are you using your gifts? How are you using your talents, whatever they may be, to impact the kingdom of God? How are you evangelizing or sharing the gospel? Because at the end of the day, Samson's individual accomplishment of carrying a gate up a mountain, it amounted really to nothing. In the same way, our individual accomplishments, my individual accomplishments, will also mean nothing. They don't have a kingdom purpose behind it. And so our text today implores us to learn from Samson's mistakes. Don't become driven by selfish ambition. Live for God and His glory. Instead of living for yourself, become a part of God's family. Become a part of something bigger. Something that has eternal consequence. And the church will not only help you to overcome temptation, it will help you do the most good by reaching others for Christ. Let's pray. And I'm going to turn things over to BD to lead us in the invitation.